you so much for that. I am truly, truly honored uh, to be with you in Brace Church in Sioux Falls. Um, I don't know if you know this, but you are, uh, you're a church that is really impacting a whole region and beyond Sioux Falls. It's remarkable to watch. It's really unheard of. You may not know this about yourself, but um, this church is really, really doing an amazing job throughout the region, honestly. So it's just so grateful to Adam uh, and his staff, the board. I've met some of your board members right on point. Uh, I believe Adam, by the way, is one of the best communicators and leaders in the nation today. Top 1% in churches today. Uh, you may not know that. Yep. And his wife, Becky, and their four kids. Uh, just amazing what God is doing through all of you. And then just surrounding himself with a great staff, Travis, Brian Rock, others, Um, Again, just truly thank you for having me. Uh, Here's a couple of shots of my family. My wife next to me, Laurie, of 46 or 7, I can't remember, 46 years, I think. My mom is 94, walks three miles a day, two pots of coffee every single day is a must, and that's the secret, I think, to her longevity. Here's the rest of my family, my son David on the left, my daughter on the right, and their spouses and seven grandkids. And then here's my hunting dog, Blue. He's the most important part of the family. Oh, Oh, you got to love him. Uh, By the way, I absolutely love your state for a variety of reasons. Uh, I come out hunting here four or five times a year with the dog and, you know, Yukon filled with stuff and just love your state. Huron, Brookings, Mobridge Pier, uh, a few other places I've been to. But anyway, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a great day to be here. I grew up playing basketball. It's always been my favorite sport. And so in 2018, when I got invited to the Minnesota Trim- Timberwolves' first playoff game in eight years, I was absolutely thrilled. I had a second row seat to watch the Wolves take on the Houston Rockets and James Harden, who was that year's MVP. And the atmosphere was just bonkers. I was waving my towel. I was fist pumping like a little kid. I high-fived a 70-year-old lady, total stranger, which, which is why I was so embarrassed when this photograph wound up on the front page of the Star Tribune. As you look at this scene, clearly this is a group of people who have some issues and need some help. I mean, take, take example, this guy right here works for Adidas, actually, Carrying a man purse. I mean, that's fine, I guess. But who carries a man purse to a basketball game? These two guys should be in anger management. They were just right next there to to, uh, Harden. This woman's calling, you know, for another drink, and she may have an issue or two. I'm not sure. James Harden, that year's MVP, dated Khloe Kardashian. If that's not a cry for help, (laughs) I'm not sure what is. But uh, But then there's me. I'm three feet away from the best player on the planet, and it looks like I'm looking for the hot dog man. (laughs) Just completely oblivious. When my kids saw this, they laughed out loud and said, what is wrong with you, Dad? The next day, social media went absolutely nuts. One of our video guys texted me and said, Bob, it's had over a million hits. One guy tweeted, this is like a painting from the Renaissance. And the Renaissance theme took off. That's all it took. And all of a sudden, I wound up in the Last Supper. No kidding, right there. <laughs> if you Google on your you know, phone or whatever, James Harden, Renaissance, this will show up. Reddit, a worldwide website, wrote this. What's the blue shirt guy looking at? It looks like he just saw the ice-cold beer man coming this way, and he cares more about that than anything else. Someone came to my rescue and said, that's Bob Merritt. He's a pastor in the Twin Cities, probably not that interested in sports, probably thinking about Jesus and stuff. I mean, come on. Give me a break. Now, clearly, I think about Jesus quite a bit, but I absolutely love sports, and we'll be watching the Masters later on today. All that's bad enough. But then a nationwide national website called High Top Athletics wrote this, hey, buddy, James Harden's literally right next to you. 
Also, by the direction everyone's looking, the actual game is taking place in the opposite direction of where you're gazing. What could possibly have consumed this dude's attention so much that he's not only ignoring the game, but also the biggest star in said game is right in front of him. He looks like he's checking the clock at his son's karate class. And on and on, this thing just took on a life of its own. Honestly, I had no idea what I was looking at, but I do this all the time. I miss stuff all the time. I miss, I miss appointments. I miss meetings. I missed a wedding I was supposed to do once. Total meltdown, total miss. And the wedding had a bad start and a bad ending. It just was bad all the way around. Um, but what's worse is I miss opportunities to actually care for people and pray for them. For years, I was running so fast, I didn't even see people. You know what I mean by that? I would just, gave them no time, didn't pay attention, had no time for a conversation, even with people that I love the most. It eventually landed me in front of a counselor for over a year. And what I learned about me is that there is a gap between the person that I am and the person I want to be. Can anybody relate to that? I want to be attentive and generous, but often I'm distracted and uncaring. You know, we want to be peace-filled, but we're hounded by anxiety. I, I, I struggle with this big time. You know, we want to be filled with joy, but instead we have a critical spirit, at least I do at times. And there's a gap between the person we want to be and the person we actually are. And then there's things like financial gaps that many people struggle with, or fitness gaps, or marriage gaps, where the intimacy you once had is now gone. And where you are now is not where you want to be. There's common emotional gaps that people experience between feeling empty and fulfilled, sad and happy, Exhausted, rested, unworthy and unwanted versus valued and loved. Now, if you're anything like me, there are some gaps between the person who you are and the person you want to be. Now, the good news is that God is for you. God knows all about your life and what's going on in your life and what might be missing. God loves you. God forgives you implicitly, wants to help us close those gaps. In fact, I believe to the core of my being that God does some of his best work when we're facing a gap. When something is missing in our life, we feel like we're alone or we're empty or something is off, I believe that is an opportunity for God to speak and to do something unique in your life. There's a woman in the Bible who had enormous gaps. She was desperate. Uh, Her husband had just died, so not only did she have a companionship gap, she had an income gap and was about to lose her home and her two sons to a creditor as payment for her debts. In those days, if you couldn't pay your debts, they would take anything of value. In this case, they were going to take her two boys who could at least serve as laborers. And this this woman's whole world was collapsing around her. And we pick it up in 2 Kings chapter 4. It says this, Now a wife of one of the prophets went to Elisha for help, saying, My husband is dead, and you know that he was a loyal servant of God, but now a creditor is coming to take away my two boys to be his servants. And Elijah said to this woman, What can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She answered, I have nothing left in the house. And isn't that how we feel when we have a gap? I've got nothing. I've got no energy, no answers, no hope. I can't tell you how many times I have felt like I've got nothing left. No talent, not a single new idea. In fact, in the green room before coming out here, I just have all these anxiety things going on inside of me. Do I have what it takes? God, you're going to show up. To quote my wife, I'm just a bald little man. And she says that in an endearing way, but I don't really don't feel like it's endearing much when I hear it. But that's this woman, and some of you might feel that way about a family matter or personal problem that nobody knows about. But did you notice the first thing that she did? 
she went to Elijah and asked for help. And I love this. Um, the first way that God closes a gap in our lives is when we, when we ask boldly. God says in Psalm 2, ask of me. He just says, ask and see what I'll do. And I love that. The power in this little word ask is amazing. The question I would, I would ask all of us here to consider, including myself, what would you ask God for if you knew that he would do it? You know, Jesus wants to fill us with his love, joy, peace, and power, but do we ask him for those things and ask continuously? I don't know about you, but I need God's peace every single day, and I leak. You know, in the morning, I'm pretty good, but by the end of the day, my peace is gone oftentimes. I wonder, what happened to me? I'm edgy. I'm critical. Seems like I'm a totally different person sometimes. I need God's love, joy, peace, and power to fill me every single day. And so in the first thing in the morning, several times during the day, I'll ask God, just give me your peace, please. And renew my joy. Renew the spirit of love, kindness in me. I love, in, uh, I love in Luke 18 how, you know, Jesus encounters a blind beggar sitting by the road, been blind all his life, and he calls out to Jesus, have mercy on me, and Jesus stops. He looks at the guy, again, he's been blind all his life, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, it's almost comical. It's obvious what this guy is wanting. The guy's been blind all his life, and Jesus stops and says, what do you want me to do? Because... I believe not everybody wants to be healed of their stuff. Not everyone wants to be free of their addiction or their lifestyle choice because then they'd have to change some things and become responsible for their lives, and that can be hard. And so at the top of my Bible in Luke 18 with the blind beggar, I wrote these words, what would I want Jesus to do for me, really? If I knew he would do it, what would I ask boldly for him to do. The first step to closing the gaps in our lives is honestly just to go to God and ask him boldly to help us in our area of need. This widow asked Elijah for help. Then Elijah asked her a very important question. He says, what do you have in your house? Um, because when we're desperate, we, we can get blinded by a fog of hopelessness, but Elijah cuts through this fog and he says, look, I know it's bad, I know it feels hopeless, but what might you still have? What resource, ability, or friend do you still have that maybe can help fill this gap? And she says, well, I've got, honestly, I've got nothing except a little bit of oil. And gang, I'm telling you, sometimes that's all God needs. Just a little bit. Just a little bit of oil, a little bit of faith, a little bit of something. Elijah said, look, go, ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go outside, shut the door, and pour the oil into all the jars. So she went, I love this, she went and she did as she was told. She didn't whine, she didn't waffle, she took action. And gang, this is the second step to closing a gap. We got to act decisively. We've got to take action in our lives. Um, ask boldly, ask decisively. Remember the TV show, American Pickers? Remember that show? Love that show. Where Mike and Frank travel around knocking on doors looking for stuff to buy. And Mike's favorite things were old bicycles that he would find under a pile of junk in somebody's shed. And he would drag it out. It'd have broken spokes, bent rims, a missing seat. And he'd say to the guy, how much do you want for that? And the guy who's like 97 and living on fumes says, I don't think I want to part with that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And Michael say, how about 100 bucks? The guy's got three weeks to live. And he says, I still might have use for that. No, you won't. You didn't even know you had it until Mike dragged it out of the shed. And I'm yelling at the TV, you know, take the $100. Go buy yourself the best steak in town and just enjoy your last few days on planet Earth instead of hanging on to this piece of junk. And I wonder if sometimes we're like that. 
I know I am. We hang on to an old habit. We hang on to an unhealthy relationship that we know is not good for us and it keeps us stuck. And God is saying, when will you take action on that? When will you act decisively on your fitness, on your job, your debt, your relating patterns, your anger issues? When will you do something about your spiritual growth? So glad to see all of you here today and those watching online. But beyond church, are you taking responsibility? Am I taking responsibility for the spiritual growth in my life? I'm responsible for my spiritual growth. And so are you. Acting decisively is something that this woman does. It doesn't make sense to fill all these jars with just a little bit of oil. It doesn't make any sense at all. But she acted decisively without knowing the income and maybe the outcome, and maybe some of you are thinking, come on, Bob, this is a great Bible story and all. But even if it's true, things like this don't happen today. Well, here's, here's what I think, honestly. It's very simple. I think the same God who filled our oceans with wildlife and things that are just unimaginable can fill a few jars of oil. I think the same God who put our world, this planet, in play. We are spinning right now as, as a planet Earth at a thousand miles an hour. We're spinning a thousand miles an hour and also rotating 66,000 miles an hour around the sun. Never came off course. Stays right on course every single day. Why? Because God just put it into play. Gravity works. Oxygen works for life to exist. It's incredible. I think this same God can fill a few jars. The same God can fill your life and mine with good things, with his peace, love, joy, power, with friendship. So she takes her little bit of oil, she starts pouring. And she doesn't know how it's happening, but the oil keeps flowing and it's like, get the jars. They're filling up because God's resources are unlimited, I'm telling you. And after every last jar was filled, the Bible says the oil stopped. She sold the oil. She paid her debts. And I came to this place in the Bible and I scratched my head and I thought, well, what about next week's bills? The oil's gone. What about next month's bills and debts? The oil's all gone. What about next week, next month, next year? Don't miss this. We think, we think it's the oil that we need. It's the oil giver. And I do the same thing. We think it's the oil. We think it's the money that we need, the job we need, the person. And those things are important. We think it's all those other things. But it's not the oil primarily that we need. It's the oil giver. The oil stopped, I believe, with the last jar because God wanted her to know that he can be trusted for the day. There will always be enough for the day for those who trust him. Friends, it's, it's not the oil primarily. It's the oil giver who, if we trust him, will meet us and he will fill us with whatever we need for each day. And this, by the way, is the third way to close a gap, and that is to trust God daily with whatever's going on in your life. Ask boldly, act decisively, trust daily. You know, remember after Jesus fed the 5,000 people? People started following him for free food. Um, and Jesus said this, look, I know what you're doing. You're, you're following me for the food. But he said, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never go hungry again. So people followed him to be filled with food, but Jesus wanted them to be filled with him. So I would say enjoy the food. Uh, last night, Adam and Travis and I enjoyed a beautiful smash burger and just stuff dripping down all over. The, and I just loved it, enjoyed it immensely. Enjoy the food. Enjoy all the good things that God is pouring into your life, but be filled with him. Be led by him, healed by him, filled by him, helped by him. Question, how are we doing with that? How are you doing with trusting Jesus daily with whatever you need? 
How are you doing with trusting him with every part of your life, even the parts that don't make sense, and asking him to help you through it? Because if you're like me, we try to fill our, our gaps with everything under the sun except God sometimes. You know, if you have a loneliness gap, how will you try to fill it? Will you trust God today that he has an answer to that loneliness if you ask him to lead you? If you have a gap in your marriage, how will you fill it? Will you be tempted to go outside your marriage or will you ask God to help you rediscover your love for each other? I know a young man right now, he has a purpose gap, doesn't know what his purpose is. So he fills it with golf and gambling and drinking and it absolutely destroyed his family. Some of you are facing a gap right now and you're tempted to give in to something or to give up. Maybe tempted to cut a corner, compromise your values or move in with somebody because it's a gap that you can't fix and gang, I get it. And I don't know why certain gaps happen sometimes, but no matter your situation, I believe God wants to fill your gap. Every one of us. God wants to fill you. The oil giver wants to fill you with his perfect love and his perfect provision. But, but maybe he's asking you to finally trust him. Because maybe it's the right ask, but the wrong time. Isn't this true? Sometimes maybe God wants to grow something in you before he gives something to you. Maybe God in this gap, this during, during this gap period, maybe God is wanting you to grow in your faith in him, growing your trust in him, maybe growing in your integrity. Maybe God wants you to grow in your character in some way. Maybe you have a relationship gap right now because God knows you're not ready for one. And he's using this gap to teach you something, to grow something in you. And then you realize that what God grew in you during this gap is what you needed more than anything else to succeed in all areas of life. When there's a gap, will you ask God boldly? You know, will you act decisively? Do your part. Will you trust him daily? Uh, Four years ago, our daughter-in-law was four weeks pregnant, and she and my son David faced a gap that they couldn't fix. Uh, They were pregnant with their second child, and so they went in for a routine checkup. But then our family was met with some news that no family wants to hear. When the tech did the ultrasound, David and Sarah noticed some concern. And after a thorough exam, she looked up and she said, I'm so sorry, but I can't detect a heartbeat. And I'm afraid this is no longer a viable pregnancy. And given the way things look, I don't think it's been viable for quite some time. She said, I'll go get a doctor. So the doctor came in and confirmed that the baby was not alive in an immediate flood of grief and loss came over them. My son and his wife held each other in their darkest moment. And the doctor lovingly explained the options. You know, they could take medication to start a miscarriage. They could give the baby time to expel naturally, or they could have a DNC to remove the baby surgically. That was on a Monday. So they scheduled a DNC for Thursday. They gathered their things. They walked down the hospital corridor under the darkest cloud of grief. Phone calls were made. We all cried. I cried on the phone as I told my son how much I loved him and would be praying for him and Sarah. And then I was very careful how I said this, but I said, David, I don't know why this is happening, but I know that God is with you. I know that God is powerful. I also believe that God can and will at times do miracles. So I hope it's okay, but I'm going to be praying for a miracle. God raised Jesus from the dead. He can raise this child, not saying that he will, but that's going to be my prayer. The next day, my son didn't have peace. He said that something wasn't right, that he had a prompting from God that was essentially urging him not to accept the report 
that their baby was no longer alive. He wasn't in denial. My son's a lawyer downtown Minneapolis. He's a very rational person. But he said, I had this prompting from God that was so strong, I couldn't ignore it. So they asked for another ultrasound on Wednesday, the day before they were going to go in for a DNC, that before they expelled the baby, they insisted on having one more ultrasound. And on top of their chart, it said this, ultrasound, confirm pregnancy loss, patient request, which means it wouldn't have happened had they not asked for this second check. So they went back to the same room. The tech said she would make it fast and get a picture that they wanted. She applied the monitor, and suddenly there was a flash on the screen. Being very careful, she paused. She stared at the screen, and then she said, that's a heartbeat. This is a viable pregnancy. And then she said, I'm so sorry. And David and Sarah were in tears. They said, don't be sorry. This is the best news we could possibly have received. The tech ran out to get the doctor who was headed for surgery. He couldn't really be bothered, but she said, you need to come. The merits have a heartbeat. And when he came into the room, he verified what he saw, and he said this, I've seen a lot in 30 years. This is top three. See you in a week. In the days that followed, their case was sent to Yale University, studied by 10 experts. When they compared the pictures of Sarah's womb from Monday and Wednesday, the experts said this, the only explanation we have is these are two different wombs. These are two different moms. Of course, they weren't. There, was not, there wasn't an equipment detect, or de- detection failure. The doctors and techs did everything right. right. We believe that Silas David Merritt is here because God did a miracle. People can doubt it, say it must have been something else. But I sit here in full belief that God brought a dead baby back to life. And we believe he did it so that the name of Jesus Christ would be made known and that people can gain hope. I want you to know that our family discussed at length whether to share this with all of you because we're fully aware that some of you have prayed those same prayers and a miracle didn't happen. And even now you're grieving and questioning God's goodness or if he's even real. And all I can say is I'm so sorry. Some of you have tried to have a family. Some of you have lost a child. And I understand. It's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. I stood next to young parents who had to bury their child. Hardest thing I've ever done. And it's not because someone's faith is stronger or weaker than somebody else's faith. Hear that. It's not about how strong your faith is. Our daughter lost a baby. Their faith is just as strong as David and Sarah's faith. We prayed the same prayers for a miracle, but it didn't happen and we don't know why. I don't know why God allows one outcome over another. I don't know why tragic things happen to good godly people except that we live in a broken world and one day God's going to clean up the whole mess. But until then, we're subject to heartbreak. I don't know why God chose to intervene for David and Sarah. All I know is that God answered their prayers and he did a miracle and that a miracle most likely would not have happened if David and Sarah didn't believe in prayer and didn't trust God daily. Gang, we just believe that because they asked boldly, and trusted God fully, that God's favor showed up on our, in our family in a miraculous way and that it would not have happened otherwise. I still believe that nothing's impossible with God. I really do. I still believe in Romans 8.28 that we know in all things God works for the good for those who love him. Not all things that happen to us are good. A lot of hurtful, harmful, bad things happen to every human being, but I still believe that in all things that happen to us, God is working for the good for those who love him. We don't understand why we get hurt sometimes. We don't understand why there's loss sometimes, and sometimes we won't know until heaven. But God is still at work for the good of those who love him So don't give up on God. Don't cut a corner, compromise your values. 
God can still do the impossible. He's still at work trying to bring about good, even from the most heartbreaking things that happen to us. Gang, if you're facing a gap today, God is for you. God loves you. God is able to close that gap. Will you? Will you ask him boldly and keep asking? Will you act decisively? Do your part. Show up. Do what you got to do. And will you trust him daily? It's not the oil. It's the oil giver. And you can count on him. He's faithful. Father, thank you so much for your love for each one of us. We're all very uniquely created in your image. We all mess up. We all get hurt. God, thank you that you love us and you're willing to heal us and lead us through these these heartbreaking gaps that all of us encounter in life. I pray that we'll ask you boldly that we'll do our part, act decisively, and learn to trust you daily. We pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey everyone, it's Adam from Embrace. If you enjoyed today's message, make sure to subscribe to Embrace's YouTube channel to stay updated. You can also click here to check out other videos. Thanks for watching.